Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Arizona Illustrated for Friday, the 7th of September, 2012. I'm Jim Ninsel, host of Political Roundtable, our weekly analysis and commentary on local, state, and national politics. Tonight on the Roundtable, we'll look at the presidential race in the wake of the political conventions and talk about some of the most competitive legislative races in southern Arizona. Joining me this evening is former chairman of the Pima County Democratic Party, Vince Rabago, Tucson Tea Party founder Trent Humphreys, and former Republican state lawmaker Pete Hirschberger. Thanks to all of you for being here. Uh, Pete, let's start with you. Uh, in two conventions in the last two weeks, who do you think came out on top in the war of the conventions? Well, I think both parties did ac accomplished what they wanted to accomplish. Uh, I thought the Democratic uh, convention was a little bit more upbeat and a little bit smoother. Uh, it, uh, it depends now on what we do between now and November 6th. Depends on the economy, uh, depends on how these uh, uh, parties follow up on those conventions. All right, Trent, your assessment of the uh, race at this point? Well, I mean, again, I think we're at a holding pattern. I think a lot's going to depend on the debates, to be honest with you. I think that, uh, I mean, people, they came out and said what everybody thought they were going to say. And uh, I don't think there were any big surprises. I don't think that, I don't think that, you know, there were, I mean, there were, there were, there were mishaps on both ends of, of, of both conventions. You know, I, I think that Romney gave a better speech than Obama did. I think that, uh, I do think that the Democrats did have some good speeches, Michelle Obama and Bill Clinton, although Bill Clinton, Clinton's speech was like 51 minutes. That's a that's a bladder buster right there. But uh, you know, I, again, I, I think that I think that we'll, we'll see after the debates. I think that's going to be an important time. And there's three of them coming up, and a vice presidential debate, which is not going to be even close. And Vince, uh, your thoughts? My thoughts are that uh, that uh, the, both parties accomplished what they needed to accomplish. But I believe that the Democratic Party and President Obama came out ahead after these conventions. Uh, it portrayed a very stark contrast of vision, a very clear choice. Uh, between someone who believes in shared responsibility uh, alongside with our freedoms and our opportunity that we have in terms of economics and, and, and efforts to, to achieve uh, on an individual level. Uh, so you see a very clear choice, I think, that was drawn, a very stark one. Uh, to me, and I think to most viewers, uh, President Obama came off very presidential. It was not the, the, the Clinton-esque speech, excuse me, but it was very presidential and he hit all the themes and the values to draw this vision and to bring voters uh, across the aisle, Republicans, independents, and of course Democrats. And of course, as you saw, the crowd was very fired up. So I think that, uh, that, uh, that President Obama uh, came out ahead in the long run in this. And I, I think we should mention uh, Gabby Gifford's performance at the uh, convention last night. Impressive to see her back out on stage. Very impressive. Tugged at the heartstrings. It shows the, the determination, the will, the American courage to, to keep moving forward uh, despite the odds. Uh, you know, the president's only been in office uh, three years, eight months, and seven days now. And, and there have been a lot of issues he's had to deal with from a, uh, an implosion on Wall Street, uh, you know, jobs lost, foreclosures. Uh, the aftermath, the economic aftermath of paying for wars. And some of these policies go back decades in terms of trickle-down economics, which have failed. So it's going to take more than, than three years, eight months, and seven days to, to, to fix this. And we're out of the ditch. We're moving forward. And I think that's what the American people saw, a vision of shared responsibility moving forward four more years. I think that's what's going to happen. And I, I, oh. I thought Gabby Giffords looked great. Uh, and there wasn't a dry eye in the House. It was wonderful. And Trent, that seems to... Yeah, I agree. It was, it was wonderful to see her up there doing that. And uh, you know, I guess my, my final thing was, and I, I don't know if I want to poison that, because, yeah, that was, that was really inspiring, but Obama probably should have sent the chair. <laughs> um, back here in Arizona, the federal judge, Susan Bolton, has now lifted the injunction against the papers please, uh, so-called papers please provision of SB 1070, which will now go into enforcement. Vince, as an attorney, can you kind of help our uh, viewers understand what this means from a practical standpoint for uh, for law enforcement? Well, for, for law enforcement, I think uh, both the, the local sheriff, uh, Clarence Dupnick, and, and the local chief of police uh, said that as far as they're concerned, they're going to keep doing the business that they have always done. When they needed to, they would contact immigration authorities. The problem that they're faced with with this new law is that it's virtually impossible not to violate the Supreme Court's uh, original decision saying that you cannot really use this in an improper manner. And now, Given the opportunity, what's going to happen is you're going to see law enforcement agencies in other parts of the state 
agencies that have already been accused of, of racially profiling a pressure to continue those sorts of activities because there is a private cause of action for citizens to sue law enforcement agencies if they feel they're not enforcing the law, which I think is just crazy from a public policy uh, point of view. You don't just create a private right of action to try to force law enforcement to do things. So they can go after cities, they can go after law enforcement agencies, and I think it's un unnecessary. Ultimately, once you'll see more stops and you're going to see profiling occur, you're going to see another challenge with the actual factual record that's going to be built up to challenge it. All that the courts have said thus far is right now just looking at the law in the abstract, we cannot say that that provision of requiring uh, dem demonstration of papers, so to speak, uh, is unconstitutional on its face in the abstract. So what you're going to see are, are the facts being developed in various situations as law enforcement agencies begin to implement this. So, Trent, there could be future legal challenges there to could this, be, but, but I mean, Vince it like depends Jeff, on how yeah, it's enforced. Vince, like Jeff before him, you know, they, they like to go out there and assume that, that police are going to automatically go, revert to the racial profiling. And there's just no evidence to support that. I mean, they, 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 brought, they brought him up. And they had, there was accusations, but the, the, the investigation they had on the, on the sheriff up in, in, up in Maricopa County found that there was no, there was no evidence to support those accusations. Well, that's that, that's that, not that accurate, was, actually. That was actually the criminal investigation yeah. of whether they'd broken laws, but there's still a civil rights yeah, investigation we'll see, underway. We'll see, we'll see what happens with that. If it's as, if it's as messy and as unorganized as their last <clears throat> investigation was, though, then nothing's going to happen there. But I think what's important is when a, when a police officer pulls you over, they establish who you are. And if they cannot establish who you are, they're going to keep digging. They're not going to let you off if you, if you say, I'm Big Bird. You know, they're, they're going to put a timer on there. If they can't establish your big bird in 15 minutes, they're not going to let you go. And that's just the way it always is. There's nothing changed in that. But the fact is, is that if they can't, if who you say you are doesn't match up with, with, with or what you have or your identification you have, of course they're going to detain you until they can find out who you are if you've committed any type of thing where, where the police have been involved. That's the way it's always been. There's nothing different. And to say that all of a sudden, because they do that, that's racist, that, that's just beyond the pale. There are a number of problems here, uh, and I think Vince is exactly right. Once the law is implemented, you will see court challenges, uh, and some of that will be driven by the ability of citizens to sue if they don't think the law is implemented. So those things are going to work against each other. Also, when law enforcement detains an individual, they can only hold them for a certain amount of time, and uh, the Border Patrol is not going to be there all the time. What are they going to do with those citizens? Are they going to just turn and let them go? Is that going to be cause for action too? It's, it's uh, got lots of problems. But well, what do they do now? They let them go, but it's not violating the law. They, they, they let them go if they can't. If, if you get pulled over for traffic violation and they can't establish who you are, you just get let go on the street, you're good? Is that the way it happens? That's what will happen when the Border Patrol doesn't show up. If there's no probable cause, and, and let me add, add to this that, uh, you know, I was a state prosecutor for almost 17 years, so I give due deference to law enforcement. I support law enforcement. But the reality is that lawsuit up in Phoenix, for example, with, with racial profiling allegations against the sheriff up there, that is not done, has not been decided. The judge has, is yet to issue it, and there's plenty of evidence showing uh, policies and impl implementation, even before Senate Bill 1070, of an abuse of power. Now, I'm surprised to hear uh, someone uh, who, who purports to be from the, the, you know, the constitutional wing of the Republican Party to say that this is all the way it's always been. The Constitution, and in fact, most true libertarians and, and, and people that support the Constitution know there is no requirement that you have to carry your ID to prove you're an American. And so to say that we should have and allow a police state when re in reality, we know what's going to happen. We've seen it in Phoenix. We're going to see the pressure of private lawsuits coming here. It's, it's going to be a mess. Law enforcement didn't want it. This was a political action uh, pushed through by a man who was now recalled, Senate President Russell Pierce, who lost in, in, in a second effort to, to regain the primary. And it's a bad idea. Law enforcement didn't need this. Uh, they were doing their job. You have Clarence Dubnik, over 50 years in law enforcement, and he said, we didn't need this law. So I think at the end of the day, it's going to be a mess. It's going to continue. You'll see court challenges that will be resolved. All right. Uh, I want to talk about some of the legislative races that are coming up in November that we didn't have a chance to talk about last week. And I think the top one that people will be watching is Frank Antonori versus the Republican. Frank Antonori is current state senator running against Democrat Dave Bradley, a former state lawmaker. Uh, Trent, what do you, it's, it's a Democratic district. Mm -hmm. There's a slight Democrat, about four, three or four point Democratic edge in this district. It's central Tucson uh, rather than uh, the area that that Senator Antonori has represented in the past. Uh, what, what's Frank's path to victory here? Does he does he 
move to the middle to try to uh, court voters and independents, or do you think he sticks with his fairly uh, conservative approach to things? Well, I think with Frank, I mean, listen, Frank has probably more name recognition, you know, for good or bad, than probably any state state representative or or a senator here in southern Arizona. I think he, he's achieved that. So people people know who Frank is, and I think there are people who like Frank, and people who don't like Frank, obviously, but Frank is a very gifted and skilled you know, speaker. He's a very gifted and skilled with the emoting of people. I think the more he gets out there and works with people and they talk to him, I think he wins votes that way. You know, I, I think that what if, if Frank works hard, if he, if he personally appears before the people and doesn't just depend on, on ads to define him or... Or, or newspaper stories, I think he has a shot. It's, it's going to be difficult, obviously, because because the the registration advantage is is, is is was well against him. But you know, Frank, he, he, he if anybody could do it, it'd be Frank Antonori. And Pete, your thoughts on how this one's shaping up? Uh, Frank Antonori does have name recognition, and it's bad. Uh, here is a, a gentleman who, uh, as a sta- sitting state senator, uh, points his finger and screams at fellow Republican members on the on the Senate floor. Uh, points his finger and screams at uh, Dep- Department of Public Safety officers because they testified uh, not according to his wishes. Uh, he has a bad reputation. He's in trouble in this election. Dave Bradley is a competent, reasoned uh, legislator, and he will do very well. Uh, we're going to see uh, a lot more about Frank Antonori. Uh, there's a reason why he's called Rantanori. Uh, and, and the, you know, here's a guy who, who wants to change the laws on speed cameras and runs through red lights. Uh, that's going to catch up to him. He has a great deal of difficulty ra- raising funds. And furthermore, we have two of the governor's staff who's, who've contributed funds to Dave Bradley. Uh, that says something. I think the Republicans are even going to abandon Frank Antonori. Vince, your thoughts on how this one's going to shape up? I, I have to agree with Pete on this. Uh, I think uh, Frank is sunk. Uh, I think his ship sailed uh, when he couldn't raise any money for his uh, his et- effort to run for Congress initially. Uh, and uh, the reality is now that the boundaries have shifted for his district further into Tucson, he's going to run into big problems with his former attitude towards Tucson. He called them bleeping hippies and, and you know, things like of that nature in Tucson. And so when those are the residents you're trying to, to represent and you, you're insulting them and, and obviously showing that you don't really want to represent them, that comes back to haunt you in the long run. And, and I, I couldn't agree more. I think he's going to have a trouble. And it's not going to be trouble just because of the Democratic votes that have grown because of the change in the district. It's going to be also from Republicans because he doesn't have any friends left. And let's talk about the House races in that same district. Again, a a slightly Democratic district, but competitive. Uh, You've got on the Democratic side uh, Bruce Wheeler, who's already serving the House, Mm -hmm. and Stephanie Mock, who won a primary over there, newcomer to politics. And uh, on the other side, you have uh, Ted Vogt, who's also Mm -hmm. serving in the House right now, and uh, Todd Claude Felter, who is uh, not a big name in politics, a party activist. Pete, how do you see that one shaping up? Well, I'm, I'm surprised that Ted Vogt uh, uh, hitched his wagon to uh, Frank Antonori, and I think that's going to cause him problems. I think uh, the fact that they're running as a team is going to hurt both of them, and, and you could very well see the Democrats sweep in, in that district. And Trent? Do you well, think- I, I think that's what the default thing would tell you, but again, you, know, it, we, we, you talk about you know, what people believe. And what, I, I think that Sometimes people grow away from what the average person on the street is thinking. And I think that, you know, Frank Antonori has a lot of pluses. He, he balanced the budget. He went up there and the budget was, was cratered. He helped balance the budget. He actually fought and got Rio Nuevo. They were going to take away Rio Nuevo. And he fought to have that put back. So there are fr- things that Frank's done for the, for the local area. And I think as far as local area, Frank does a good job representing our local interest and fighting for those things. When I think he can show that, too, when he speaks to the people. If he, if he lets himself be defined by the media... He has a problem. I don't think Frank's going to do that. And in terms of uh, Ted, you think Ted, Ted has a well, good you know, shot at, at Ted, maintaining a Ted, House seat over there? Ted has not been outspoken as Frank, obviously, but he's made all the same votes as far as, as doing things that are good for Southern Arizona and Arizona in particular. And I think that uh, if they run on their record, if they show that, look, you know, you gave it, you know, the voters gave us a chance, we went up there, we fixed the budget mess. You know, obviously, it was hard decisions had to be made. There was no, there was no easy, simple decisions. But we made those decisions. I think that that'll weigh a lot, especially with, with I believe, will be an overwhelming uh, Republican electorate with, with Romney over Obama here in the state. Vince, your thoughts on how the House race is shaping up in that district? I think the House race in that, in that particular district is shaping up uh, very difficult, in a very difficult way for Ted Vogt. Uh, 
uh, to retain his seat. For the reasons that uh, Pete mentioned, uh, he's hitched himself to, to Frank Antonori. You're going to see, I believe, a lot of Republican support for Dave Bradley, and you're going to see that bleed away in a drop-off vote with, with respect to, to, to vote. Uh, you know, you could almost come up with the, the campaign slogan, you know, don't vote Antonori. And uh, at the end of the day, having done that and tied it, hitched his, his uh, horse to that wagon, it's going to be a problem for him. Um, Stephanie Mock is a very impressive uh, first-time candidate, uh, master's degree, and has spent a lot of time not just, uh, you know, working uh, to, to push ideological uh, issues, like Ted Vogt has, has been pushing tort reform without ever even practicing as a lawyer, thinking that I've just got to go in and push this thing, despite the fact that what he's pushing is unconstitutional under the Arizona Constitution. So I think Ted Vogt has a tough time in that district. How about uh, this district on the north side of town, Trent? I think that's, uh, that's your area, yeah. <laughs> and, and it's uh, also a slightly Democratic-leaning district. In that one, you have a House race where you have uh, one Republican, Ethan Orr, and, and two Democrats uh, who are newcomers to politics, uh, to, to uh, running, to ha holding office at least, uh, Mohar Sidwa and uh, Victoria Steele. Uh, your thoughts on how this one's going to go? I, I think this is a district that's close enough where shoe leather is going to make a difference. And, and I'll tell you right now, Ethan Orr has been working as hard as I've ever seen a state state candidate work. And uh, and I think I think that the, from what I'm hearing, even from Democrats, is is that is that he has a great shot of, of getting that seat. Now the other two the other two candidates, you know, they, they they I don't think they have the name recognition or the experience to uh, to to compete at that same level. But I I wouldn't even say that if Ethan Orr wins that seat, that would even be an upset. Pete, you're familiar with Ethan Orr's uh, right. record, uh, uh, very active in the nonprofit yeah. group. And Ethan Orr is a credible candidate. He's, he's uh, excellent at what he does. I think he'll represent himself very well, and he has a very good shot. One of the issues is uh, he's the only Republican running. Uh, will the voters be uh, sophisticated enough on the Republican side to single shot him? or will they uh, vote for Ethan and then one of the Democrats? And furthermore, will the Democrats vote just the party line and stuff? So uh, that's, that's going to be a close race, but Ethan Orr does have a, a good shot at that. Hey, can, we get, can we get an endorsement? Come on, endorse the Republicans. Good my, for your my, soul. I, I like <laughs> Ethan Orr. He's a friend of mine, and he is, he's very good. My issue with Ethan Orr is he's anti-choice, and that's become a very significant issue for me. Uh, especially given uh, what this Arizona legislature has done and the, and the war on women. I, I, I'm having difficulty with that. And Vince, how do you see this one shaping up? I think being the sole Republican candidate gives him that possibility of coming through that race for the reasons mentioned, if, he, if the Republicans single shot him. I think for the same reason, though, that was just mentioned, the fact that there are two uh, female candidates running against him who are working extremely hard with shoe leather uh, and also you have another female candidate in an area, the, the overlay grid of, of uh, Nancy Young Wright running for, for county supervisor. Given those dynamics of, of the attack, legislative attacks on, on women's choice uh, and, and against women, I think it's a, it's a tough race. And so you might have crossover vote that siphons away from Republican women that tips the balance if, if those Democratic candidates, Mohir Sitwa and Victoria Steele, uh, continue to do the job that they've been doing, and, and they may come out the winner despite this single shot possibility. All right, and there was a county race we didn't discuss last week between uh, Pima County Supervisor Sharon Bronson and her challenger, Republican Ethan Orr. This is another district that's. Not, not Ethan. Oh, I'm sorry, excuse me, <laughs> Tanner Bell. Republican Tanner Bell, uh, and uh, I believe that uh, this is a district, again, that's uh, Democratic, and then Independents come in second, Republicans come in third, but it's also a district where uh, the folks who are upset with the county right now feel like this is where they can tip the scales. Does Tanner Bell have a path to victory here, Trent? You know, Tanner, again, we talk about work. Tanner's going to have to work really, really hard to beat Sharon Bronson, and, and, and I know there are a lot of good people that back him. I just don't see the work that it's going to need to do that. And, you know, th these, again, these are small, very few people, if you went and got them on the street, could even name who their, their county board of supervisor representative is. They just wouldn't know. So, I mean, there, there is always room in these races, especially if, if you could show some sort of, uh, you know, of the, yeah, there's some, something really bad going on here. You know, the problem that, you know, the people that are trying to overthrow the county have is that the city of Tucson looks so bad that the county people can look in comparison, hey, we're not that. And I think that they, 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 they skate by a lot of issues where, where in another case, if we had, you know, high-performing cities within the county, 
they might be in a little bit of trouble in. But I think in this case, I mean, Sharon Bronson has made some bad decisions, but I think she's kept her head down and quiet. So I, I think that Tanner Bell has, a, you know, as, as much as I hate to say, I think he has a hard time to, 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 to get a lot of traction there. And Vince, uh, is Sharon Bronson vulnerable in your estimation? You know, every election is an election. So you never, uh, you know, discount the chances of somebody winning a race against an incumbent. Um, but I think this election is not the last cycle. Uh, for example, where you had a wave of Republicans winning in races that were very unexpected across the country, including here in Arizona. And so I think in this particular race, Sharon's done a good job. She's worked hard for her constituents. Uh, at the end of the day, what's going to tip the balance is, is whether people are willing to reject the spending from these secret groups that, that uh, are, are incorporating outside the state of Arizona, trying to sling mud uh, with false and misleading statements about the county that are demonstrably false. People don't want to see Carl Rove style secret PACs that are forming outside the state of Arizona trying to influence Pima County. And I think voters are going to reject that kind of politics and they're going to support Sharon Bronson for the job that she's, she's done representing the constituents in that area. Sharon Bronson wins this easily. easily. Okay. Uh, this week, the Tucson Unified School District announced a hiring freeze. It came one week after extending the contract for John Petticone, the superintendent there. And uh, Pete, we were talking about uh, John Petticone's plans uh, on the show a few weeks ago, and we ran out of time. And you, you wanted right. to talk a little bit about what uh, right. Pentagon had proposed regarding these school closures. Yeah. There, there's, a, there's a validity in his proposal to look for building new schools as we look forward for education in, in our uh, state and our county. Uh, closing some of the older, out-of-date schools and building some new schools. We need to look forward. Uh, there's talk about, oh, no, we don't have the money to do that. Well, we could just stay stuck in that spot uh, forever. We need to, to at least put it on the table and look at uh, progressing forward uh, with our educational plan, uh, which brings us to uh, the miserable state funding uh, that we have for education in Arizona. It's an embarrassment. Uh, and uh, John Petticone's willing to, to look outside the box and, and, and go against that trend. And we saw a report this week showing that uh, Arizona had made the deepest cuts in education of all the 50 states. Uh, you've been in the legislature and seen the education funding uh, as it has progressed over the years and haven't been there for the last couple of years of the cuts. But uh, what's your assessment of, 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 was that a valid report, do you think? Yes, I do. And it, it is extremely harmful to education in, in our state and it damages us for the future. Uh, our future is these young children. Our future is uh, an a workforce that has an education uh, to grow our jobs in, in Arizona, in Pima County. Uh, and it's harmful when they cut that much out of our education. And Trent, your thoughts about uh, well, that? As far as the schools go, I, I'm going to disagree entirely. I think the worst thing they can do is, is give more centralization to TOSD. Look, some of those schools are the heart of those neighborhoods. And, uh, and it, with the way education is going, the way technology is going, Centralization is not what we're doing. It's not happening in the workforce. It's not happening with education. And, and to say that we need to bring all the students to one big location, I mean, that's, you need, we, need to, we need to keep those schools in the neighborhoods where parents have a choice and parents know the teachers and parents know the administrators. I think the more that you, you send them away and bust them someplace where you lose that connection, I think the community loses. I think the kids lose. And I think that you get more corruption and more of the stuff that we come to expect out of TUSD, which is sad. That's not at all what the proposal is, is to bring all the kids to one central location. You're building new schools in, in, in centralized locations, right? You build a school in a location. And you're yes. closing down schools in, in these neighborhoods that mm -hmm. have been there for a and long time. And the demographics have changed. And so you're moving with the demographics of the population. And Vince, I, another topic that has kind of been splitting TUSD is this whole ethnic studies uh, program and, and uh, the state law that the district has been dealing with there and a lot of criticism directed towards Petticone regarding the ethnic studies. Yeah, I think he, uh, he failed on that score in terms of handling a, a political crisis that was pushed by uh, you know, the ideological uh, Attorney General Tom Horn when he was superintendent of schools for the state and then now as Attorney General. And, and it was you know, targeting one program. Mexican-Americans, Mexican-American studies. Even though it was called ethnic studies, that was really what it was all aimed at. So I think when that crisis hit, I think he, he failed in that score. I, I was a little disappointed to, to see, uh, you know, I, I think under these budget times, 
uh, he should have been out there, uh, Petticone, taking a $35,000 pay cut to help the district. Uh, we didn't need to give him this 35000 which he then gave to a, to a good charity, but, but really that, that's the salary of a teacher. You know, we could have used that money plus another to have two teachers. And I'm not sure, I'm not convinced yet about this proposal, uh, this idea of, of having these big schools. Uh, we do have to do something. I agree with Pete. We do have to do something. We have to think outside the box. I'm just not convinced that that's the way to get there at the end of the day. All right. And the open primary initiative has been uh, taken off the ballot, put back on the ballot, taken off the ballot, and now finally put back on the ballot. So voters will decide this, and this allows all the candidates to run in a single primary with the top two vote-getters moving on to the general election rather than our current system where we now have uh, party primaries and the nominees of each party move on. And, Pete, you're supportive of this uh, idea. That's right. And I'm glad the voters are going to get a chance to, to say yay or nay on this. Uh, what it what it does is it's going to uh, enfranchise the voters to have choices. Right now, in our extreme politics in both parties, you have the extremes voting in their candidates, uh, and the voters, therefore, in a general election, don't get to choose but uh, between two. And and now they're going to have more choice, and we're going to see a change in politics as a result. And Vince, uh, just about out of time here, but your thoughts on this? One? My thoughts are that we needed to wait. I think we're going to have unintended consequences. You're seeing bad results coming out of California and Oregon, and ultimately what you're going to see is some, in some districts you're going to have still control by one party across the board because it's the top two that win. And so I think there's going to be unintended results, and there's going to be other things that are going to happen, like with the city elections down here, which are partisan. That's going to be gone. There's, there's problems with it. We could have waited. We just had redistricting. I think we should have waited to see what the new districts would have brought. All right, and Trent, we I'm are. I'm in agreement with Mr. Rabago. Okay, and that's uh, going to be all the time we have for tonight. But you can learn more about what's happening in politics by visiting azpm.org. And while you're on our website, we'd love to hear your thoughts about tonight's program, so be sure to leave us a comment. And to find out the latest from AZPM, follow us on Facebook and Twitter. Stay tuned next for the news hour, and then at 8.30, tune into Arizona Week for an in-depth look at President Barack Obama's economic plan. Next week, Arizona Illustrated will take a look at new efforts to improve science and math education in our local classrooms. I'm Jim Ninsel. Thanks for watching, and have a great weekend.